Congratulations. Your project is complete. You're ready to open your building and welcome your employees and visitors in. But as quickly as the ribbon is cut, the data needed for operations is either out of date or missing, incomplete. And as we most know, real estate and buildings represent the second largest expense of most organizations next to employees. Construction is expensive, but it only represents a small portion of the overall cost of the life cycle of a building. Approximately 80%, I think we heard that earlier, of total cost of ownership occurs in operations after construction, post-occupancy. Even a small improvement in operations can have a dramatic impact on the overall life cycle cost of a facility. And let's face it, COVID has really changed the way that we think about how we work, about our buildings and the use of those buildings, the role of those buildings, and it's really changed it forever. Trends such as hybrid work, industrialized construction, these were all underway prior to the pandemic. But over the last two years, we've seen a significant acceleration of these trends, enabled by digital transformation of collaboration tools such as Teams and Zoom, um, <clears throat> big data, IoT, common data environments. All of these have enabled us to work in a remote way. Um, and it's, again, changed the use of our facilities. So where do we start? Where do we start on this journey? We really need to think about getting good data and improved collaboration so that we can optimize our assets, have better performance, increase the portfolio optimization. I think we've all seen charts like this. Uh, Nate mentioned it earlier, as much as 95% of data is lost or not used in operations. And that data loss happens throughout each of the phases of construction, design and construction. In our world, in facility management, we see most of this occurring at handover to operations from our perspective because that's where our users tend to need that data the most. But where's, where does it come from? We see things like poor collaboration, systems that don't talk to each other, processes that aren't well-defined, uh, no structure to share data and standards. <clears throat> and we see this in operations as well, more and more. Uh, things like outsourced service contracts, um, an aging workforce and people retiring and taking some of that legacy knowledge with them as they move on to their next chapter. <clears throat> and why is data at handover so important? there's still a lot of poor interoperability of tools and operators may not have the information that they need for that day zero readiness when they take over a facility. And it's not just about asset data, it's also the things that happen during the construction process, maintenance that occurs, anything that's happening during the construction process itself up to handover and uh, in occupancy. I've been talking a lot about data but what kind of data are we actually talking about? I like Franklin Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, particularly habit number two, that states, begin with the end in mind. I think that's really relevant here with construction projects or BIM and BIM for operations in particular. If you can't articulate what you want out of the data, how you're gonna use that data, it's really difficult to hold your project teams and contractors accountable to deliver the value that you expect. I had the opportunity um, several months ago to co-host a webinar with Autodesk's Chuck Mees. And Chuck, in that presentation, um, posed three questions that every owner should really be thinking about prior to embarking on this journey. Number one, who's going to use the data? What data are we going to collect and how's that data going to be validated and maintained? Really important things to think about going into a project that you expect to leverage this data fully through the whole design construction into, into operations. Um, <clears throat> one of our recent projects, uh, project manager had a really great um, comment about this. It says an educated owner is more likely to get value from their BIM and asset deliverables. 
and we continue to say we strive to achieve owner-driven processes that find the right balance between being descriptive but not overly prescriptive to the point that it impedes the process. So we want to find that right balance of data. I'm going to talk about a few examples. First one is CSOB, um, their construction project team. They really understood that balance and they took the time to educate themselves before setting out on any BIM deliverables and requirements. They're one of the largest financial organizations in the Czech Republic and we're working on a, um, <clears throat> a new headquarters building. They were setting out to get LEED certification. It was a fairly large building, 670,000 square feet or so, housing 1,400 employees and 300 trainers, trainees every, every quarter or so. And their goal was to create a modern working environment for their customers as well as their employees with an emphasis on sustainable design or a gentle approach to the living environment. They really wanted to target an effective management of costs. So not only in data and operations, but to effectively understand and manage the cost. And from the start, they knew they wanted to deliver value to their facility management functions at the end of the project. So before writing any requirements at all, the team went out and visited other sites that were demonstrating value from BIM deliverables in operations. They clearly understood the three questions and got those answers ahead of setting out to establish their, uh, their process. After that, they brought together all the key stakeholders, good example in the last presentation, including consultants to help them write the requirements that they wanted to incorporate into their contracts and into their project planning based on that research that they did up front. Facility management processes are hard enough. By ad adding data and making access to that data very easy, they were able to um, really extend the life of the BIM model in the data that they collected throughout the process into operations. One of their goals was cost management. Prior to this project, their typical project had roughly 40 to 50% accuracy of operating costs when they were doing their budgeting activities. Now, through this new process, they're more like 80% accurate in terms of what their overall cost of operating the facility is. A lot of focus is on construction costs, but they were looking beyond construction costs and really understanding what it was going to take to operate the facility. Some of their key takeaways were creating a single source of truth a platform for better collaboration, effective corrective and preventive maintenance procedures and tracking, and improve readiness for future projects, leveraging that data and their learnings for the next project and the next one after that. CSOB example is a really good and fairly common facility management um, story. I'm taking a, a look at a similar example, but in a very different industry. We're going to talk about CED, which is, uh, instead of a facility operator, they are using BIM for operations and maintenance of hydroelectric power, power plants. CED operates power plants across Italy and Chile, um, and over the years have developed or acquired hydroelectric plants that are delivering the power needs for over 104,000 households across their regions. In a similar way, this team collected experts from industry, from their own company, so they brought together a team of the plant operations folks from CED, the people that are actually responsible for maintaining the facility, infrastructure and engineering consultants, even researchers from the local um, technical college in Torino, and some IT um, consultants to help bring it all together in an effective way to enable all of the communication needs. The goal of the project team was to apply an, an innovative approach to maintain and manage their hydroelectric plants. The fundamental element was the creation of an advanced, what they called knowledge database, which might sound familiar. So they created a digital twin of the, of the plants to enable this collaboration. By standardizing, applying a systematic approach to the way that they do things, 
they were able to create a very effective digital twin, what they refer to as a virtual data room. And I like that concept. Um, it, in this one virtual approach, they can easily find the data that they need, quickly access attributes of assets, documentation that they're required to maintain and produce, um, expirations for the documentation, so everything that they need to really be compliant and operate the facility. The virtual data room also became the foundation for all of their maintenance activities throughout the plants. All regular maintenance, preventive and on-demand maintenance is, is conducted with interacting with the data and the processes within the system. And that data then persists in the system so that they can leverage it later as they do the next planning or the next maintenance activity. And again, this isn't a, a building. Some of these facilities can span as much as four kilometers. This one facility can span as much as four kilometers and have thousands of pieces of equipment that they're required to maintain, track, inventory, keep all of the, the parts that they need to support that. Prior to the digital twin, the virtual data room, their processes for managing operations of these hydroelectric plants were very manual and disconnected. Now they enjoy a system that provides a lot of benefits. They have an integrated maintenance calendar across all of their plants. They can involve all of the stakeholders by giving them access to the data that they need. Efficient maintenance for ticketing and uh, tracking. And again, a visual database that allows all of the stakeholders to quickly and easily access the information that they need. Those are really two examples of the proper planning for a typical BIM for facilities and operations um, management. I'm gonna pivot now and talk about UC Health, another example. Instead of assets and facility, they're leveraging and went through a similar process of understanding their needs for requirements more around space and as in um, space planning and space reporting requirements that a hospital or a hospital system like UC Health is required to conduct. UC Health is a fairly large health healthcare system. They have 12 hospitals, including the University of Colorado Hospital, and a growing number of clinics and facilities under its broad umbrella. They have 26,000 clinicians or clinical staff and employees to support and serve their, um, their customers, their patients. And they have a very limited staff to manage all of the required reporting needs that they have that, that are required by regulatory uh, needs as well as internal planning. And there's a dramatic change in the way that occupancy over again COVID and how people use and interact with the space over time. So by powering or pairing the power of BIM with their facilities data, they can now maximize the performance and stay agile for the future. Again, with the limited staff, by moving things from 2D CAD to, to BIM, they're able to more quickly maintain their drawings and, and be able to react much more quickly. The data has really helped the finance system because it's more reliable, it's more up-to-date and accurate they've been able to identify and pinpoint opportunities to consolidate facilities and minimize vacancies. <clears throat> Oops. Sorry. There we go. Um, <clears throat> they also have requirements around reporting for regulatory bodies like the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, the Joint Commission, um, National Fire Protection Agency, and they, they have to have access to that data when the auditors show up to be able to produce that data. And again, with a limited staff, by having the data that they need in a system that's easily maintainable, they can produce those reports on a very regular basis and provide the data that's needed. So these were really three different industries, different use cases, but there was a common theme. And so to summarize, these organizations all created tremendous value by closing the loop and building a continuous feedback process between architecture, engineering, and construction and operations, which led to smoother transitions, better design, 
more efficient operations, reduced costs, and a better, higher quality experience for their occupants. So again, let's turn that ribbon cutting event into a thread that binds the AEC and operations workflows together. Thank you.